Hey everyone, it's Randy Malden with Supply Leaders Academy, and today we are going to be doing our questions and answer follow-up webinar that we did from last week when we did our supply chain resilience webinar. We had a lot of questions, and tonight Howard and I are going to go over those questions and just kind of have a free-flowing discussion about different topics and different solutions. And then in the future, what we might do is we might actually open it up for other people to join us during these discussions if we can figure out the technology to make it work for everyone. And that's definitely what we would like to do is get more people here so we can actually have a conversation with other folks. So, Howard, why don't you go ahead and just uh, say hello and let everyone know a little bit about you. Go. Hey, everybody. If you haven't seen my webinar, Howard Knapp here. If you haven't seen my webinar last week, uh, Captain Knapp. Army, California Army National Guard. Uh, last position was a brigade logistics officer. Before that, I was a company commander of a transportation unit. Currently, right now, I am a buyer at Moog Space and Defense Group, where I buy for satellites uh, and space and defense projects. I'm also a graduate of Auburn University with a degree in supply chain management, and I'm a certified professional in supply chain management. Awesome. Very good. Yeah. So as you can tell, Howard knows what he's talking about, especially when it comes to supply chain resilience stuff. So he, he definitely knows what he's talking about. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. You know, we're just going to talk about supply chain resilience. If you want to see the previous webinar, just uh, click down to the links below. They'll show you the previous webinar. You can definitely go ahead and, and watch that on your own. And then tonight we're going to focus on questions that we receive from folks about specifically supply chain resilience and the current situation with COVID-19 that's going on. Other people had other kinds of questions that are going to go out there. So what we're going to do is just go ahead and kick it off. What do you say, Howard? Yep, we'll do. Let's okay. do it. Let's go. All right. As you can see, supply chain resilience, Captain Howard Knapp, Dr. Randy Malden, USMC, retired. And tonight are the questions and answers. Now, what kind of questions could you have? You know, the, the whole supply chain resilience thing is complicated. It's not it's simple to kind of explain, but then the actually execution piece is complicated. So the experience of the military constantly doing the planning, constantly building supply chains that are resilient to operate in any environment is very important. So, I, you know, we definitely had some good questions and we're going to go through those tonight. And before we get started with the questions, Howard, any thoughts about last week's webinar? Anything that you want to kind of follow up with or things you want to think about or talk about for folks? I think one of the key things here, and we talk about a lot in, you know, in the questions, I actually have a few answers for them is really related to the five step process of, you know, uh, analyzing your supply chain and making sure it's resilient. Um, I think it's really good process. It's a good process to use, especially with, you know, the military uses it as well. And FEMA uses it currently right now, you know, to do supply chain resilience. Uh, I think, you know, one of the main things, you know, I really want people to hit too is especially the fourth and fifth phases where it's really about collaborating with your suppliers right. and making sure, you know, that you can see it from other points of view and, and kind of getting their input, getting their viewpoints on different things, because, you know, you may have one thought process or your, your viewpoint on something and they may have something totally different or may concur. But, you know, going back to supply chain, it relies on the entire supply chain working cohesively as one, you know, unit or working together and you know you definitely go through that with a five-step process and you know i really believe in it you know it works you know we use it too in the military and a lot of times when we do rehearsals you know anytime before we go out in operation we're out there you know doing running it we got our operations orders we go get our mission and we go through step by step and then we also go out there with our sand tables and see okay you know once we pass once we cross over once we get here you know once the trucks are hit this spot what do we do and we go through it step by step and usually questions come up, right? And kind of helps to make sure that everybody's on the same page and everybody knows what they're doing. So, you know, I really, really, you know, believe in that five-step process. And I suggest it for everyone who wants to make sure that their supply chain is resilient or to even improve the resilience of their supply chain. Right. And especially the point of rehearsing. And you mentioned that when people talk about it, there are actually questions, even though you wrote the order detailed, you explained everything in what your mind you think is the right way to where everyone would understand when it comes to what the way you see things may not be the way someone else sees things. So right. definitely have that rehearsal kind of lays that out. So let's go ahead and uh, kick it off with the first question. They're not in any particular order, just, uh, just had them out and we're just going to kind of talk about each specific question. So the first question is, will manufacturing eventually bring down the cost to pre COVID pricing, or will this be an opportunity to expose vulnerability and keep them high? What do you think, Howard? 
do you think a manufacturing is going to basically going to be pricing back down to pre COVID or we got something new coming up? What do you think? I don't know. So you caught me off guard that you were going to go in order. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, hold on. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I can go ahead and answer my thoughts on, on this while, while you're looking at your, looking up your notes is, um, you know, what my thoughts are is that you know, it's, it's just a new economy. It's a, it's, it's new people supply demands all kind of jumbled up right now. People are thinking differently. And you know, always remember that the customer has the final vote that no matter what your cost might be, no matter what your cost from your vendors might be, the customer it will buy or won't buy. And I think what we're getting ready to go into is a period where people are really going to hunker down and just take care of themselves, take care of their family, focus on the essentials, the things from before where they bought 10 different pairs of shoes just isn't going to be there that way for a long time. People are going to realize that you know one pair of shoes is just fine. So no matter how much you're willing to lower that price, it's still not going to move because people just aren't going to want shoes. So the, 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 my mind is you, know, you as, as supply chain managers, one of the things we're going to have to really use. And one of the things we talk about in the CPSM training is target costing that formula where you have your market price, the profit you want to make. And then the difference between those is your target cost. And then you have to work your vendors, work your supply chain to come down below that specific cost. So that's, that's where my mind goes when we start to talk about pricing before COVID, after COVID and into the future is, you know, the market as the final say. And so as a business, we have to determine how much profit we're willing to make on that thing and then really drive our costs below that, which is going to determine the prices we're willing to pay our vendors. So it's going to kind of trickle all the way down the supply chain as we start to realize what the market is willing to pay. So what are your thoughts, Howard? What, what, what were some of the things you, you thought about when you had, when you saw this? Well, well, so one of the one thing that I really thought about, you know, a little bit different from yours also, but, you know, I completely agree with you is also the logisticals concept of it. Right. So, a lot of our stuff has been manufactured in China. We know that as we've seen now, the impact COVID-19 has had on our supply chain. It's, you know, it's devastated our supply chain. You know, we're used to having things made cheap in China or, you know, or across the globe. And that's really helped our price. And that's kind of like you were saying, it's really kind of shaped the way consumer behavior is, right? We're used to buying a lot of stuff for cheap, you know, buying 10 different shoes because the price was down, right? So now I think the supply chain is going to have to really as supply chain managers have to really kind of balance out also security, right? Um, are we going to bring it back? Are we going to make it domestic? Are we going to do it in Mexico? And you know, wherever it ends up going, that will definitely have an impact on price because China has a logistical system and the manufacturing capabilities to do things for cheaper, you know, but then they also don't provide the security. And we're talking about resilience here, right? So, you know, I, I think the prices may come down come down to pre-COVID-19 prices, especially, you know, if we bring stuff domestically, you know, with wages and benefits and everything else. But at the same time, you know, if another tragedy or crisis happens like this again, you know, we'll have a little bit, we'll have a lot more control, especially if it's domestic vendors. And as you mentioned, you talked about the procurement manager, the buyer, that's where the role of the supply chain professional in an organization has really been elevated during this situation. You know, one we saw in the news and the media where supply chain was critical to move supplies to help people stay alive. And now supply chain becomes even more critical to move supplies to those manufacturers, to those markets so that they can be profitable. So no matter what genius idea someone had to sell something, the engineers created this thing. And that's you know very important to have that new thing, but then to actually make the widget, the stuff that goes into the widget. That's where the supply chain professional comes into play to hit those specific costs to make sure that's a profitable thing. So, I, you know, my point here is really that the the, the role of the supply chain, the, the role of the supply chain manager, is elevated, and from the ashes rise the out of the ashes rise, people rise, you know, and and those leaders start to step up. So this is where you're really going to start to see: Do you have a uh, what I call a transaction processor 
or do you have a supply chain leader, a supply leader within your organization? That's where you're going to start to see how people start to elevate and change, or do they cower in the corner and suck their thumb? You know, who, who knows what they're going to do? And that's what you need to look for. You business owners that are watching this right now, you should be really looking at your procurement supply chain personnel, seeing, hey, are these the kind of guys that are going to help me get to the next stage and survive this thing? Or are they the ones that, you know, I really need to think and start finding some, some stronger leadership in this area. Any other thoughts on this one, Howard? We'll move on to the next one. That's good, sir. All right. So here's the one. It's what is the possibility that India will be the major hub for supply to the international market? Now, when I saw this one, I was, I was, it was very interesting because if we noticed right before COVID-19 happened, the President Trump went to India to reestablish some relationships there just as they were increasing tariffs on China. So you can kind of started to see a little bit of it starting to happen right before COVID-19. And then the situation happened. And now it's like, OK, where are people going to move from China to where? I think you remember when we were doing the training, Howard, we talked about this situation that China was coming up in increasing labor and that we had to move our manufacturing somewhere. We didn't know where, but we had to start thinking about where we're going to go. And well, now the situation has kind of elevated that need to think faster and move faster. And if you haven't been in those markets or haven't thought about those markets, then you're already behind. So, you know, will India become an international market? That, you know, depends upon India. Are they ready to receive those orders? Can they process and manufacture the things? In other words, can you sh quickly shift from China to India? Is that a possibility? What are your thoughts on this, Howard? Yes, uh, so I, I absolutely agree with you, too. You know, I think, you know, as you're talking about President Trump, he's already began that process, you know, trying to move manufacturing out of China with the tariffs. You know, people, uh, companies or businesses have already begun that process. But like you were saying, you know, I think it's definitely created more sense of urgency to get, the, you know, move manufacturing out of China. So I was actually, you know, looking online and I saw an article from Business Today published last week. Uh, and they were stating that 1,000 foreign firms have plans to shift manufacturing from India. And out of those, uh, out of those 1,300 of those company, companies currently are active in pursuing production plans. Uh, and they were doing them in mobiles, electronics, medical devices, and textiles. So this is really, it's already begun the process. Uh, but the main thing, of course, right, is the cost difference with China. Um, you know, in Southeast Asia, it's about 10 to 12% cheaper you know, fun fact for India. So uh, India has actually also begun the process to trying to reduce that gap because they have, uh, you know, with hoping for economies of scale and then also local incentives. Yeah. They've actually also on top of that, no, sorry, sorry, and also on top of that, the corporate tax mm -hmm. is uh, at 2.517%. So they've lowered it because they've also identified this as potential for them to capture the manufacturing market. And right. for new manufacturers coming into India, their new tax rate is now 17.9. That's making it the lowest in Southeast Asia. So they're postured. They're trying to incentivize companies to come in and, and get that process done quicker. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. And it's where you mentioned before, people are moving already, getting to that point so that they can actually, you know, do what they need to do to, to move. And that's always takes time. You know, so that's definitely something we have to think about is how are we going to move from one place to the other and how long will it take? Because even though, one of, the, one of the points I thought about before, when you started mentioning pricing and margins and difference in wages and labor, as you go back to my original point, is that something's worth only worth what someone's willing to pay for it. And you go to high end art that you see on the movies all the time. We have these guys stealing these million dollar paintings. Well, if I if one of those million dollar paintings ended up in my house, I wouldn't know it was worth a million dollars because I just don't appreciate those things. In other words, it's not worth a million dollars to me. It's worth a million dollars to somebody else. So the labor rates we're willing to pay are only that high or that low based on the markets willing to pay that price. And if you think about the shift in the U.S. where we have, what, 22 million people are unemployed now, there's going to be a shift in the market, labor market here in the United States. And how low is the labor market in the United States willing to go in order to work? 
and you know it's easy for the government to to subsidize these things or for the unions to negotiate higher wages but if those wages and those subsidies don't actually turn into something that's sustainable then those prices are going to have to drop as well i mean it starts to get really complicated you know kind of just go back to the original question is india going to become a major hub i think howard nailed it with uh, all the, his research finding that yes they're ready and those businesses that are looking for other markets now from China to go into India, there's a, absolutely an opportunity. What I would caveat with that is India is not the only market you could go to. There's other places, Mexico, Eastern Europe, Europe, maybe even in the United States and some of these places where they're going to have a lot of people looking for work and willing to work for lower wages just so they can feed their families. So it's going to be something different. So just, you know, it's not just India. There's other places to go as well. Any other thoughts? Yeah, they're really trying to, and it's like they're really the ones start trying to, you know, with all this incentives, they're the ones really trying to push for it. Right. You know, like you were saying, they've already identified that opportunity. And I'm sure they, you know, with the Corona epidemic going around, they especially know and they identified that people are now going to be re relocating out of China. And they're really trying to push for that incentives to get all the, uh, get all the business. Yeah. That gets into the international affairs and, foreign powers, you know, cause, cause there may be a price for China to pay for all this that's going on, but that's a whole different discussion for a different day. <laughs> so yeah, this was a good question. I think it's a very practical question and how to make a roadmap to recover after COVID-19. And you know, the things we've talked about up to this point, pricing, moving from the markets, how do you build that roadmap on what actions you're going to take right now? You know, and it's important to identify actions because it's easy to talk about these things. It's easy to make theory, but ultimately you've got to take action. What are you going to do first? And we talked about rapid response planning, even resilience planning. One of the key topics is priorities. What are your priorities and what do you need to do first? And first is, you know, take care of your, your family, take, be able to survive, food, shelter, water, that kind of thing. But then after that, you got to make a market. You've got to find a customer, a customer willing to pay to for whatever it is you're trying to sell. So once you're able to identify that market, then you can build a plan to fill that niche, fill that gap, fill that market with whatever is coming up. So that's going to be step one is where is my market? Who is my customer and what are they willing to pay? And am I willing to sell my stuff for that price? What are your thoughts on this, Howard? <laughs> sure, you nailed it. <laughs> you kind of had my answers. <laughs> That's good stuff, sir. Go ahead. What do you? What are your thoughts on this? Uh, is this so? This is the one for um, roadmap. Correct. Yeah, that was kind of the one I didn't answer, so I didn't get to it. To be honest, <laughs> are you still? That there? was the last oh. one. Yeah, I'm here, sir. Can you yep. see me? Yep, I can see you. Let me see if yeah, I can see. That you. was the last one, sir. I didn't get to really answer that one. I didn't get to look at it as much. That's okay. No worries. Let's, let's go to the next one then. How can we use technology to validate risk with supply chains? Technology is one of my pet peeves in that technology is a very easy crutch for folks. It's one of the things I talk a lot about in my dissertation when I did it way back when about the Marine Corps and how technology failed and how people had to step in to fill those gaps. So even though technology is here, we have a lot of technology systems. We have a lot of you know AI, artificial intelligence coming up that can handle a lot of the stuff. We have to remember that human judgment must still be part of the process. So technology can run simulations, but somebody has to put the data into those simulations to make them actually work or not work. So you know, Howard, what are some of your experiences with technology? I mean, you're you're in the industry right now, and currently with the military systems that they're using. What are some of those things that you're seeing? So, you know, I, I completely agree with you again, sir, you know, about the technology is there to help to assist, but it's really not there to actually make the final decision. It's, it's you know, ways for you to give you information. And, you know, obviously in the military, it's a way for you to collect data and turn it into information. And there's several key, you know, technology that you can use now that really helps you, you know, especially in 2020, things are evolving so much. And, you know, the use of artificial intelligence now is really growing. I know, uh, you know, there's different things. So one of the things is, you know, you can actually use mapping solutions. Uh, this technology uh, it helps you update and map your supplier relationships. Uh, technology such as, you know, EDI, electronic data interchange, allows supply chains to easily connect and assess risk. 
it you know allows for an entire supply chain to speak to talk together as one supply chain you know a lot of big i know uh manufacturing automotive manufacturing is really big on using edi you know and walmart uses edi you know all the way from you know when something comes off the shelf at walmart everybody down the entire chain knows what stock levels are at walmart and you know and they don't even need to go send po's you know the technology already lets the supplier know that the levels at a minimum level you know at the whatever the designated level for stock is uh and the suppliers do their own things and get it over so you know that really helps automate things and make things quicker you know there's also things too that uh technology can use for environmental risks uh mm -hmm. artificial intelligence really helps along has come a large way with that you know using using large data and able to help yeah, analyze you know trends for example um you know a lot of companies use uh environmental um let me see hold on sir use it environmental technology to help assess or you know see what the environmental impact will be in the future right. it can help do things such as predict weather uh it can combine forecasting data and it can also give you real time updates so you can kind of assess if you know the weather is really something that your company is sensitive to and there's also such thing as believe it or not geo geopolitical risk as well too um as right. of right now there's big systems that are used that uh, you know for example because we're so globally reliant you know especially with China and India and other places like that there's a lot of complexity with you know the political environment there and there's believe it or not there's a lot of there's technology out there that scans uh it, it scans oh, hold on sir scans oh scans social media right it looks at all the different news agencies and they're able to provide you with you know risk assessments on kind of what you know the impact that the current ge geopolitical environment is doing. right yeah and, and even all these systems working together you know when you're creating simulations you've got to integrate them together to actually produce some kind of simulated result and even then that simulation is only good as the data from which it was created from so you know for example as any simulations that may have considered a pandemic you know what data would they have used in the from the past to kind of simulate this specific situation one that comes to mind is you know recent ones where the h1n1 flu the swine flu the bird flu in recent times all the way back to the influenza back in the early 1900s you know that was another time you know when we had a pandemic and how things happened and how what did they do so what could we do as supply chain managers is look back at those situations and look at our industry to kind of see what is happening what is going to change when we have a pandemic and even though the type of technology we have today didn't exist in the 1900s we can think about you know changes in communication changes in transportation changes in the environment people what were those impacts and kind of figure that out and that's another question a little bit later is how do we kind of estimate the future based on what's currently going on and that is to look deeper into history and kind of find a situation that's similar and make some educated some smart guesses you know but again technology must go back to the human to make the actual decision any other thoughts on this Howard? I think it's right to that experience and you know training for those actual supply chain mm -hmm. managers where they can give you all this information but ultimately right. as a human that makes that decision with all the information that you have you make the best the decision that you can and you have to make a decision i think that's what we're starting right. to see in the media currently with the decision to open or not open specific economies in specific states you know these political leaders now they, they got to earn their money. You know, as we, in the military, we said, now you've got to make a decision. What now, Lieutenant? You know, it's like, you have to make a decision. Yeah. Somebody has to make a decision and you were elected to that position. So you need to make a decision. And as we're talking here, you know, supply chain leaders, supply leaders are going to give data to decision makers and those decision makers need to make decisions. And that's going to be the hard part. Somebody's going to have to make decision and be accountable for the, that decision, right or wrong, one way or the other. So the next question is how long the supply chain disruption will be carried forward and what should be the remedy? So it's kind of, you know, another way of saying this question is how long do we think this particular area will, we, will experience a supply chain disruption? And my thoughts are it depends upon the industry, depends upon what's going on, because some industries actually, believe it or not, are flourishing right now and other industries are falling flat. You know, for example, sports, no one's going to the sport arenas. 
you know, however, online platforms are, you know, spiking because everyone needs to communicate and do things like we're doing right now, you know, communicate online because we can't be face to face. So it kind of depends upon the market and what are we going to do about it? You know, and I go to go back to, again, you got to find the market. Who's your customer? What are they willing to buy, pay for? What are they willing to buy and what are they willing to pay for it? That is what we need to figure out as a business right now. Who you're currently selling to may or may not buy your product. You know, it's your vendors that are providing you stuff may or may not be there to actually provide that stuff. So the supply chain leader is going to be engaged on this. The supply leader is going to be engaged on this and talking to vendors and needs to talk to your salespeople to understand what the customer needs. And it's going to be back and forth, back and forth. It's no longer this long term planning. Well, we're going to think three or five years down the road. That long term planning is over now you're in it you need to start making decisions every single day how long will this last as long as it takes you need to be ready and dig in for the long haul what are some of your thoughts on that howard and so i think what you said too about it being dependent on industry for example amazon's hiring tens of thousands of people you know because now the market has shifted now people don't want to go to stores now they want to buy things online and get it shipped so definitely i think the you know the, the demand for personnel and for capacity has def drastically shifted to more online. So like you were saying, you know, there's definitely other places that are hurt, you know, that there's no demand. And now you got places that have a high surge in demand. Right. And, you know, and being able to react to that is things really important as well. And just use the the example for, for Amazon hiring all these people. People want to shift to, to buy online. It doesn't mean people that we're not making stuff anymore stuff still needs to be made so the manufacturing footprint still needs to be there but now they need people to fill the orders in other words pick things off the shelf and put them in a box so somebody needs to make the box somebody needs to make the tape somebody needs to drive the truck somebody needs to load the truck unload the truck move it deliver it to the home do all these different things all these things you know all this stuff so you know as a business you've got to kind of imagine envision using your your vision your imagination where am i going to fit into this what did I used to do? Who used to be my customer? Who could be my new customer? What is my new market? And this is where things get exciting. I actually, when I came out of the service was in 2010 and we were in the middle of a recession and a depression and, and you know, or you know, whatever you want to call the word. And I couldn't get a job. So I had to think, I had to get on my feet and make things happen. And so I'm kind of getting excited about this because it's a new opportunity to make something else happen. And, you know, so you know, just scan the horizon. You gotta be an entrepreneur. You got to have that entrepreneur mindset and get ready for it. And, you know, I don't know about you, Howard, but, you know, it sounds kind of sicko, psycho, whatever you want to call it. But it's like you're getting excited about this. It's like, man, there's opportunity everywhere bubbling up. You just have to be able to see it and take action on it. Just like Howard being involved in this presentation and building this. He's building a reputation. He's building something that he's going to be able to rely on for several years because people are going to know him as a resilient supply chain leader and able to solve these kinds of problems. So that's thinking, that's actually taking action on stuff. So what are your thoughts on that, Howard? Yeah, thanks, sir. Another thing that goes back to flexibility too. You know, we can plan all you want. And, you know, sometimes just the plans don't go as planned. You know, like in the military as well, we, we plan all these missions and something else happens and we just have to be able to be flexible. You know, still have the base plan, but you can also, you know, deviate off of it and be flexible. And it goes back to, you know, critical thinking, and thinking outside the box, you know, there's situations that we're put in that we can't, you know, we some there's some things that we can influence and some things we can't. And you have to focus on the things that you can influence and, right. and be flexible with things and make Very things good. happen. Sir. Very good point. There's some things you can't affect. So don't spend time, waste time on things you can't change. Focus on what you can change and make a difference. Make a decision and move. Yeah, just say, just make a decision and move, do something. The sooner you do something, the sooner you'll learn what's not working and find out what is working. Now, again, it gets in the entrepreneurial mindset. You know, if, when you decide to join RFX Academy, that's one of the main things we start with is just set up the right mindset so that you can be successful because you have to think differently, think differently. All right. Question here though, this one's perfect for Howard. What methods do resilient supply chains use to remain agile? What are some of the thoughts? Or, yeah, this is one of the things, we, you know, going back to the military and give kind of a little bit of time for Howard to kind of gather his thoughts, because I know he's got some thoughts on this one. You know, it's, it's always being able to <laughs> have a plan, be able to move, but knowing that something's always going to change. 
always going to change. So, you know, it's constantly thinking, constantly not resting on your laurels, not thinking that, well, don't don't marry the plan. Don't assume that because you plan that that's the way it's going to go. In fact, it probably won't go that way, but at least you'll know what it should be so you can make the best decision in that end result that you're trying to achieve. What, what, what's some of the things you've got there, Howard? Well, so I think there's a few thoughts here that I have you know, from you, especially from a supply chain standpoint. Uh, one of the things too is you got to really set your expectations. You know, uh, being having an agile supply chain, uh, it's, you don't have to do something new, but you got to have, I think, you know, key KPIs to really ensure that, you know, you're performing correctly. You know, just don't have KPIs that are internal, you know, especially in supply chain, you, you know, how our performance is affected by everybody else in the supply chain. So even if you're your supply chain department or, you know, you, as the people you're managing are doing well, there's some, like we're talking about some factors that you can't affect or, or that, you can't control, but they still yet affect you. So you got to be able to have those, you know, good KPIs, good expectation sets, and, you know, kind of see how you respond to things. Um, let me see what else. So you also, there's also the thing about one of the things I think hard production and scheduling data. You know, a, a lot of companies struggle with stocking out, which directly impacts agility. Many small, medium-sized retailers that do not have the money, I think, to invest in fully integrated ERP systems, uh, manage production, planning, and scheduling in, in separate data systems, and sometimes even on spreadsheets. And I think having that integrated together, having production planning and scheduling systems under one system uh, allow uh, demand-driven sales figures of having more efficient and uh, effective supply chain network. Another thing, too, I think is also the training, you know, having your employees trained properly will help with kind of having more agile and because it comes down to not just the manager, but also goes down to the people. And when you're a manager, one of your primary responsibilities when I was a company commander was training my soldiers, you know, as a pro when I was a production supervisor, my primary concern was training my, uh, training my employees. And how you know having proper training really helps with agility. Also, really take the time to train your people correctly so that they can also make educated and informed decisions themselves. I'm going to jump on that point for a moment. There is that you know one of the things that makes the military so effective, the U.S. military, is just what you noted there was that people are trained. And that, you know, in, in the military, we train, we, we train two up, two down. In other words, I should be able to do the job with people two ranks above me or two positions above me, as well as two people below me should be able to do my job. So that if anything happened to me, they could fill that position quickly. And that gives you that agility that we're looking at, looking for right here. So that's a, that's a great point. In other words, having people that know the plan, understand the plan, understand the options, the commander's guidance that we talked about in rapid response planning, rapid supply chain planning is knowing what that ultimate goal is and having people trained that can execute and achieve that goal. If you don't train them, you can't wish them or hope they'll do it right. Instead, you've got to train them to know that when you when they think like you and they have the flexibility to make decisions and you trust them to make those decisions. So that's a, that's a very good point. People are key to an agile supply chain. It also comes down to leadership as well, sir, right? Having, you know, a strong leader that understands that, that really focuses on developing his or her team is really essential too, especially if you're not there or something's happening, you're handling a different situation. You want to be able to rely on, you know, your second in command or, you know, whoever's in charge of making that decision can make the right decision because you can't always be there to make all the decisions, especially learn that too as a commander that I have to make sure that my platoon sergeants, my platoon leaders, my lieutenants, you know, we're all educated and trained properly. So when we send them out on missions, they, you know, they would conduct the mission accordingly and complete the mission, even if I wasn't there handling the rest of the company. And yeah, something I learned through my Boy Scouts experience is one of the you know, old guys said, you know, he was very wise when he, what he said is never assume someone knows something unless you train them on how to do it. So, you know, just assuming they know how to do something is not enough. If you haven't shown them or explained it to them and actually let them do it before you needed them to do it, then you can't assume that they're going to know it. Or nor can you be angry when they don't do it the way you thought they should have done it because you never told them how to do it in the first place. 
So that's a very, very good people. That's what it's going to end up at the end of the day, not systems, not the technology. The people are what's going to make your supply chain agile. Question. It goes back to India. How will the exports from India be for sporting goods equipment manufacturers as this sector is for recreation and people will not invest in this immediately? So this is talking about a specific market sporting goods and the the understanding that India exports a lot of sporting goods. How do we feel this sector is going to be? Uh, what are your thoughts on this, Howard? You know, some of the things I was thinking is that although you may may not see, you know, a huge recreation gathering that we've seen them in the past, people still need things to do. So maybe they won't gather in such large groups anymore, but they'll still gather to do these sporting goods or sporting events, sporting type activities that are out there. So what are your thoughts on this, Howard? And I think right, going back to what you're saying about supply and demand, I think the demand will still be there. You know, it's been part of human nature. You know, it seems like to be in sports for thousands of years, even down to the Greeks, you know, they're doing sports, Olympics. And I don't think that's going to change. You know, like you said, people will maybe social distance a little bit more, but you can still play sports. Right. You know, just being different, maybe not tackle football or something like that. But there's other sports, soccer and stuff like that, that you can play, you know, without having to touch each other. Uh, True. So I think that'll definitely be affected as well. Yeah, it, and, it's, and it's a market. You know, just we were talking about before, who is your customer? What other things can you do with those type of manufacturing skills? So, you know, you're shaping you know, protective equipment. Okay. So instead of creating sporting protective equipment, maybe you're creating medical protective equipment. Maybe you're doing something else, you know, you're creating something else. You know, I, I don't know. You have to, again, think about what the need is going to be, envision it and start to fill that market, adjust your manufacturing capability or your manufacturing of whatever you're building and shift and change. Be ready, be, be faster than the competition. There's a lot of sporting good manufacturers out there. So they are also thinking of this question. What are you going to do about it? Now, as a supply leader in this area, who can you tap into? Talk to the vendors. The vendors know what's going, going on because they are trying to sell their stuff. And their, their, vend their customers are probably your competitors. So keep your ear to the ground to those guys. Talk to those guys. And you might get some ideas on what how the market's shifting, how it's moving, how it's changing. You know, another way to gather information and make better decisions. This is a, a business continuity. Good question here. When things are coming off the rails, how strong is the supply chain contingency plan? How do we plan for the unexpected and get senior leadership to buy in? Tricky, right? You know, so this specific question, you know, talks about, I, I see a lot of talk about contingency planning, but the big point that I see is how do you get senior leadership to buy in? That started a long time ago. If your senior leaders don't trust your supply chain personnel, your supply chain professionals, it's because the trust and credibility isn't there. Someone in the past did not build a trustworthy, resilient supply chain to where now they don't trust it. And they're probably wondering what could they do? So, you know, if you're thinking, what can I do? How do I, how do I get trained leadership? train my senior leadership to trust me, you've just got to make decisions and build that trust and credibility. It takes time. Howard, what are your thoughts on this? I uh, agree with you, sir. So it's about, you know, the relationships that you build with, you know, the, your people, you know, like we we're saying, not just technology, but it has to be a person. So I think that's why it's important to, you know, going back to the resilience, real the five stages, right? I think stages four and five really hit this home. It's, you know, fourth phase of action and the fifth about re assess and refine, you know, of your resilience plan. You know, in, in the fourth phase, you go over your resilience plan with tabletop exercises and you're going play by play. You know, it really helps you come up with you know, as many scenarios as possible that can cause disruptions. So naturally, you may come up with, a, you know, up with every single possible scenario, but coming up with a plan that is similar and will allow you to have a baseline to work off of. Uh, and having absolutely no backup plan or clue of your supply chain's composition can be disastrous. But that is why, too, I think the fifth stage is very important. Having a plan frequency to review and refine your plans, you know, because a lot of people forget about that, too, is, you know, you got to always constantly adjust. There's always changes in the market. You know, you know, supply chains are always evolving quickly. 
uh, going back to that fifth phase of always, you know, going back to your plan to, you know, whatever frequency you determine is important for you. You know, if it's once a year, you know, every six months, you can go through, assess the plan, see where you're at and, and go from there. But the other thing though, it helps build that relationship with your suppliers or whoever your, you know, what we call key stakeholders are. If you just, you know, meet them one time, go through the plan and that's it. You know, what does that do for business continuity, right? But if you're continuously going through and making adjustments, right, you're not only, you know, making you more flexible and, and catching up with the times, but you're also reestablishing that relationship with your key stakeholders, it's going through it with them over and over again. So if something happens, you know, going back to that senior leadership buy-in, can go back and say, hey, we already got this business continuity plan. Right. We're constantly reviewing it, refining it, and assessing it and going through it. And that should definitely help with senior leadership buy-in because you're putting in the effort, you know, and the time. And if they see that, you know, they'll definitely know it's important to you. And that's where you, you talk about planning and exercising the plan and going through the plan again to refine it, to make it better. You know, that's important because when you're going through that exercise, not only are you coming up with a plan to do something when certain situations happen, but you're training people to think what things do they need to think about? You're building your leadership pipeline because when you're doing those exercises, you're going to find those key leaders, those natural leaders that are actually taking charge of the group that people are following and making decisions to support and, and help them get things, get through things. So building that senior leadership trust requires senior leadership to implement planning and exercise those plans to kind of understand what everyone's going to do during specific situations. So it's not something you can execute not right now. And now that you're in the situation, it's like, well, how do I get senior leadership to trust me? It should have happened a long time ago. Now is 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 the wake up call. It's kind of like, OK, these are a lot of the other things that we've overlooked. We haven't trained our supply chain folks. We haven't been doing the resilience planning. We don't have a rapid response planning process in place to where if things happen. We can make changes. And that's one of the reasons we're creating the supply chain resilience program is so that you can start to see how to do these things. And, and for the long term so that you don't come out and, and get into a situation like this, because even though this is one situation, a pandemic, a very bad situation, it's not the only time this happens. You know, when you have a flood, a blizzard, a drought, an economic recession, an economic issue. I mean, any number of things can cause these type of disruptions in your supply chain and every industry is different. So you have to think about these things. So when we open up supply chain resilience program coming up here in the near future, Make sure you're on that list to get started with the first opportunity to get involved in this program, because we're going to be building a lot of these processes that you can implement right now. So just kind of keep that in mind as we kind of go through the rest of the slides and get ready to wrap up here in a few minutes that, you know, that we're building a program that helps you put this stuff in place. And if you're not in a senior leadership, that part of that program is also going to be learning the leadership skills to build this trust and credibility for the future. Let's go ahead and uh, move on to the next question. How do we forecast people availability? <laughs> that was a good one, sir. Good for you. <laughs> so, so how, how do we forecast people availability? What do you What do you think? I'm sure I'm gonna find out. I think I had a good answer for that one too. <laughs> so, so one of the things we do, and one of the things I learned, we were, is is that whenever we're doing project planning, there comes a point where you need to actually assign people tasks. And you need to be realistic in your assignment, understanding that there's people are, are a finite resources. There are only so many of them. They can only work so long and they can only do certain things. And that when you run out of people, you've got to get more people or get other people, to, or other things to do those those things. That's why technology is so important and so helpful. It's because we can get technology to do those redundant things so that we can have people stay in those other positions of decision and judgment where we need them. So what were some of the thoughts that you had on this, Howard? Well, so, you know, going back to the resilience plan again, uh, that's why phases three and four, four are important for forecasting people availability. You know, in these phases, you're collaborating and reviewing your findings from phase mm -hmm. one and two with your key stakeholders, right? right? Then during phase four execution, you're going through it and reviewing your selected scenarios. And having this as a topic of discussion, will be a perfect time when you're going through it with your with your key stakeholders to bring this up, right? Say, hey, if this event happens, such as a flood, right? You know, how will this affect your personnel? How will this affect your staffing? How will you think it'll affect the whole supply chain? And going through that together, you know, your suppliers, 
or stakeholders, wherever it is, will, will have a better idea of how, you know, going maybe even back from past experience on, you know, how events just like it have affected their own supply chain or, or their own company, for example, right? And that, that'll definitely help you kind of get a better idea of how to forecast for yourself, how, you know, people will be available. Uh, and if you're attending to forecast for something, you know, outside of your stakeholders, such as maybe the number of available trucks or dispatchers available, right? research the impact from similar events in the past. And, you know, and I really truly believe in, even when there was a, a commander, when I was, we were doing brigade, you know, we were planning staff, you know, courses of action for the brigade or battalion commander. Uh, you know, we would always hope for the best, but also plan for the worst. So, you know, plan for worst case scenario. So if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't get to that point, at least you were, uh, uh, you know, ready for it and we were, could go from there. Right. And you think, you know, planning, executing, exercising the plan, I think is key in this area to where it's easy to say that we're going to, we're going to move this stuff from this point A to point B. Okay. Well, how much stuff is it? How many trucks do we need? How many drivers do we need? Do we have somebody on the other end to offload it with a forklift that can drive the forklift? Do we have space there? When we did, uh, you know, training exercises in regards to flying into an, an austere environment. So, you know, thinking about the military, the Marines go in, they knock down the door and they build an airfield. Next thing you know, the Air Force is bringing stuff in for the Army. Well, can you imagine 50 planes all in the air at the same time at the land on the airfield, unload, take off before the next plane lands? And now all that stuff takes time and you've got to exercise it. And what we would do, and it sounds silly, we would line people up and we'd put their tail numbers on them and say, okay, here we go. And you simulate flying in a circle by walking in a circle and you would land and you would count off the time and you start to track all your fuel consumption. Cause there's a lot of stuff going on. Bottom line, you've got to exercise the plan and you got to run the numbers, what I call run the numbers. Like, okay, how many people does it really take to do that? Do we have those kind of people? Do they have the skills? Do they have the right things? Can they do these things? How's it going to work? And actually run the numbers and put pencil to paper and figure it out because it's easy to say, but it's harder to do. And when you start running the numbers and testing your theories, your assumptions, then you start to see how realistic is this plan. And that way you can make a different plan. It's easy when you're burning brain cells and electrons. It's really easy to do that kind of stuff. But when you actually start to execute, now you've got trucks and planes and people all moving at the same time everyone else is moving too so you got to think about all that stuff exercise the plan any any other thoughts on this one oh yeah it goes to, like you were saying so we're going back to execute execution you know having a collaboration with all your other stakeholders you know for you for example like you were saying right with fuel consumption right so maybe the you know, load master or the pilot would think of something like that. If you're like a logistics officer, that may not be something on your mind. Right. But if you have like the load master there with you saying, hey, you know, what about these factors? Or what about this? You know, what about fuel consumption? What about load times? They, you know, everybody could put in their two cents and make a better, more detailed plan. And the more detailed you can get, the more prepared you'll be. And then throw on top of all of that, that we, everything we just said and say, now you've got to have protective equipment on to do it because there's a virus in the air. Virus, yeah. So everything we just talked about, which is complicated, just got 10 times harder because now you people can't see, they can't hear, and they speak that's muffled. You know, it's like when we used to put on NBC gear, uh, you know, chemical warfare gear. And then all of a sudden everything got real hard, real hard because you couldn't just it didn't happen as quickly. It wasn't easy anymore. So you know, too, sir, I think with the COVID-19 has really showed, too. That now with planning, it's like you can literally plan for the craziest events. On that, oh, this yeah. COVID nineteen has really shown you that anything is possible, right? So right. if you're planning for the worst, you know this might be something that you've actually taken into account. So when we do our planning now, we need to think about the worst case scenario because now anything is truly possible. And just to throw a shout out to all those veterans out there, this is where our experience and our training comes into play and can help people now that have not been in the military because now they're in a military type situation and they were never trained for it. So your leadership, your ability to think through problems and solve problems, it really going to make a big difference right now because people are looking for leadership. So for those who may be wondering what to do or what kind of people to hire, 
you may want to consider looking at your veterans again and using them for a different skill set than what they may show on their resume. You look for that leadership and that problem solving ability. Most importantly, their ability to remain calm and focused when everything else is going to crap. OK, so just put that shout out there for all of those veterans out there. Time to dress up your resume and say something different, like I can solve problems in the middle of chaos without any problem whatsoever. <laughs> what do you think about that one? <laughs> It's good. That, that made good. me nervous, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, though, right? I mean, you know, think about it. the military against this calm, cool, collected, and just execute. Yeah. You know. Yeah. This last slide is we're coming up, and I got a few more questions that came from our R two P two. I don't know if we're gonna have time. We only got a few minutes, but these were the concerns that people had because I asked, you know, what is your main question and what are your top concerns? So I kind of put all the concerns on one slide. And a lot of what we've talked about kind of addresses each of these concerns, potential loss of suppliers, losing competition is negative for the supply chain industry. What they're talking about there are a number of vendors in a particular area to where one vendor may be able to dictate the price. We saw this with the mask and all of a sudden they were charging $7 for a 10 cent mask. You know, that's, that's the danger of losing competition. The reboot setting us back years while new suppliers and startup developed. You know, it's a new market. You have to look at it as you're developing a new market. If you are in the supply chain field, you're going to go out and find new vendors. Vendors look for new opportunities and new customers. It's a new market. Uh, what has loss been done and the Deming method plan do check. These are all different concerns of ways people want to talk. You know, so so Howard, based on things you're 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 hearing on the West Coast, because I'm on the East Coast, but on the West Coast, what are some of the major concerns people are talking about? Hold on, sir. Major concerns. Ooh, you got me good on that one, sir. Uh, <laughs> hold on, so let me think about it. So major concerns with supply chain. Everybody's just pissed off about haircuts, sir. Right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um so I you know one of the things too, right? I, I think is you know, when are things gonna get back to normal? That's the question on everybody's mind. And especially here on the West Coast, we were one of the first ones to actually go into lockdown. And we're continuing to be on lockdown. I actually just saw an article today from our governor, Governor Newsom, saying that uh, we're going to be on our lockdown even, you know, till further notice. But they're really trying to ramp up testing. And, you know, trying to, people are just concerned with, you know, if, if you're not considered essential, you know, when can you go back to work? How long will your safety, will your safety finances or, you know, your safety account help you? And, you know, when can you? actually start making money again you know will the stimulus check me enough you know it really goes down to just managing finances and that's right. a, I think a big challenge for everybody right now uh, you know especially and even for companies right sir for companies that were heavily leveraged on debt that yeah. you know used that borrowed money from the banks to, to grow their business right now they don't have any kind of safety buffer financial safety buffer and right on their seat of their pants and you can really see that now yeah. You know, these companies that are going bankrupt, not all, but some, you know, are going bankrupt because they didn't have any kind of safety buffer. And, you know, it's going a big concern for a lot of people, right? Even going into two months or three months of shutdown, you know, how much really of a safety buffer do you have? Even from personal finance perspective, right? How, how much do you have in your savings account? How long can you survive? They say to have three to six months of, you know, your expenses in your, in a savings account, you know, how many people actually have that, you know, and, and when you don't have money, what are you going to do? So, yeah, I think that's a big concern here, sir, is definitely how, how long is this going to last? And when can people go back to work? How long would their finances hold them off? My, my thoughts on that is, one, there is no normal anymore. There is a new normal. You need to adjust. Don't wait for anyone to save you because they're not coming. So, you know, think about that. You know, there's always somebody else that has a higher priority and you think that they're going to give you money. They're not. You know, and, and it's just me being pessimistic. And it's just my attitude is don't wait for someone to help you because at the end of the day, they're just not going to be there when you need them. So adjust to the new normal. Realize that what it was isn't what it's going to be and, and make a change. That's when I get my motivational speech thing in that, you know, you really just got to realize there's a new situation and you've got to find a new market. You got to find a new job. If you're not, if you're in a job that's considered non-essential, find a job that's essential. They're going to be shifting. They've got to build new things. They've got to create new manufacturing jobs, be willing to take a lower wage. 
you know, that maybe you're making $25, $30 an hour and the only job you can get is $10 an hour. Well, that's, that's the only job available. So guess what? Everyone else is working for $10 an hour too. So at what point are you going to make a decision and do something? Don't wait till it's too late. And, you know, in California, here in Florida, anywhere, you know, this message goes to everyone that, you know, the, 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 there's a new normal, the new, the old normal's gone and change and adjust to your situation and your surroundings. Don't wait for the government to save you because if you're paying attention to the news, they're, they're like, we're going to be out of money too. Sooner or later, the bank's going to stop. The doors are going to close. The music's going to stop. And then they're going to say, okay, now pay your bills. And if they've been giving you all this money all this time, then you don't have the new skills you need to make money. So that's kind of what I, I would offer there. And then the I think too, goals. sir, it comes off two things to raise your attitude mm -hmm. and your circle of influence that Chris was talking about earlier, right? You don't need to worry about the things that you can affect. Worry right. about the things that you can do. And also have a positive attitude, right? If you're going to have a crappy attitude and you think everything's falling, then yeah, it is going to fall, right? If, you, if you're if thinking that, hey, I can figure this out and make something happen, I affect my own destiny, then you'll be okay. You just got to figure out what it is and, and take action. Hey, just, just think of simple things, food, shelter, water. You're used to going to the grocery store to buy your food. Now the grocery store is closed. What's your next step? Where do you go? You grab your fishing pole and you go fishing. Right. <laughs> you grab your you grab your rifle, you go hunting, you go make snares, you find food, you figure something out, you figure out a different way, you know, and like you're talking, it's all about attitude. If you think there's a different way, there is one. You'll find it. You know, old Tony Robbins, you know, it's not about resources, it's about resourcefulness, being resourceful to go find things, find solutions when you have to find them. And that's what our supply leaders are doing right now. They're being resourceful to find solutions for their businesses. And we would be smart to look at the things that they're doing and start to apply those to our own personal supply chain, not just the one that's involved in our business and be resourceful and finding different solutions for different things. So. Ooh, preach, sir. Preach. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. Okay. All right. Well, these are some other questions. This came towards the end, but these came from the R2P2 training. But what I want to wrap everyone up with today is one is take what we talked about today a lot of questions but start to build your action plan think about some goals you want to take objectives you want to reach and what's going to drive you to achieve those things what restraining forces are going to stop you from moving forward and come up with a plan and what maybe have been a three or five year plan now is going to be a three or five week plan you need to think and develop those plans we mentioned before you get a mind map go ahead and just go to cpsm training forward slash mind maps for procurement go to this url get a free mind mapping guide and then they'll get to the mind mapping software it's pretty cool howard and i use it for different things also if you'd like a copy of this book which talks a lot about being agile and how the marine corps adjusted way back in operation iraqi freedom and what people had to do to get things done it's a lot the big lessons out of this book are leadership how do i get leadership just remember it's not over and, you know, definitely take the time right now, get on our early notification list. So when we start our supply chain resiliency program, you can be one of the first ones in. It's going to be a limited program because it's not only going to be online training, but there's going to be interactive exercises, table exercises, planning, coaching, a lot of different things. So there's going to be a finite amount of resources that Howard and I have to give to everyone. And we want to make sure anyone involved in this program gets our full and complete attention. So get on this list. So once we open this program, you can be one of the first ones in because it will be limited to only a few folks to get involved so that we can give you our full attention to make sure that you're able to build a resilient supply chain for your business or for your future. Howard, do you have anything else to say for tonight? Yes, sir. So, you know, closing statements from me, you know, this goes back to the supply chain resilience program that we're starting, me and Dr. Randy are starting. So it's about the value that it brings. I think me and him with our military experience can really bring the value of building a resilient supply chain. Some of these things you would think come, you know, that are common sense and actuality they're not there's a lot of things that you have to think about when you're building a, a resilient supply chain and having the framework you know what kind of actions to take all that needs to take into account because when something happens when the next crisis happens you're going to want to be prepared and if you're better prepared than everybody else what we call actions of the objective the first person to take action is going to get the resource you're going back to limited resources you know especially in a crisis situation any kind of inventory, any kind of resources 
goes quick and it's the person who gets to it first is the one that's going to get it. And then going back to you, the influence and taking action, you know, take, t- take action, go through this program with us. We'll help you build a better resilient supply chain. And if you're in a, in a company, if you're not just a business owner, but if you own your own company, you know, you not only own your own company, but you're also, you know, a, a employee. If you're a supply chain manager, you can take this program with you and, and build a better supply chain or more resilient supply chain in your own company and take your, your career, take it to the next level. Right. And it's, and think about this. If people are being laid off because businesses are closing and they're choosing who they want to keep and who they're not going to keep, will you have the skill sets? Will you have the knowledge to make yourself valuable for that company or for that next opportunity? And that's what we're offering you here is the opportunity to get more knowledge, more value, so that when you're able to offer more solutions, better value solutions, you can make a big difference. And another thing Howard mentioned was framework, that when you build a framework, which we're going to show you how to build a framework and identify the framework that you can work within to make better decisions. So it's, it's going to be a, it's a framework that's going to apply to any situation that when you see the situation, you're going to be able to take the framework and apply it there and execute based on what you know needs to happen. So look forward to everyone joining us on this program. Definitely go to the website, put in your name, click the link below, and then go ahead and put your name and email address so that we can notify you right away when the program opens up. Because again, it will be limited to a few folks. And I say a few folks, you know, I don't know what the number is going to be yet. But once we decide on that number, once we shut it down, it's only going to be for those folks involved in that. And that'll be the last time we'll have it open for a while because we want to make sure we build out this program and we give everyone our complete attention. With that, have a wonderful night, and we'll talk to you soon.